Roses. Everybody is talking about in Guns, Guns and Roses, yeah, about you being the fifth member. We're not going to talk about that today. Are you happy? Well, you know what? Actually, you just caused me to not want to really do anything else here anymore. So, yeah. yeah. So, okay. actually, you know, there's a lot more to talk about. Oh, that's why I want to talk about the Neil Young tour and stuff. You you make me realize that I ain't such a bad person after all. Oh, come on. Uh, what's wrong? Well, what did I do? Am I such a bad guy? You didn't do nothing. A band of outcasts from the small towns they grew up in, Blind Melon's rise to success was truly unique. They enjoyed two years of hype before they even released a single record, thanks to their connection with one of the biggest rock stars on the planet. But the band's history with Shannon Hoon would be short-lived. His volatile behavior coupled with his substance abuse derailed the band's career. In today's video, we're going to take a look at the history of the band Blind Melon. The original members of Blind Melon all hailed from small towns across the U.S. Guitarist and bassist Roger Stevens and Brad Smith came from West Point, Mississippi, while frontman Shannon Hoon hailed from Lafayette, Indiana, while rhythm guitarist Christopher Thorne came from Dover, Pennsylvania, and last but not least, drummer Glenn Graham was from Columbus, Mississippi. Apart from bonding over their small town roots, the members could relate to one another because they were also outcasts. The history of the band really began with bassist and guitarist Roger Stevens and Brad Smith, who met in Cub Scouts in West Point, Mississippi. Their town was about similar size to the town that I grew up in, 8,000 people, and with not a lot to do, the pair did a lot of hell raising around town, shoplifting, destroying mailboxes, and throwing firecrackers at neighbors. Stevens was convinced that at a young age, he was going to be a superhero. In fact, it's not a dream that's really out of the norm for a lot of young kids. But it was by the age of 13 that he would be attending a Van Halen concert that really changed his outlook on life. He would tell Rolling Stone, I saw David Lee Roth up there jumping around and Eddie playing the guitar and all the women screaming and I thought, well, I guess I'm not ever going to get any superpowers or anything. Maybe this is a more realistic thing to be. Smith embraced music at a young age, playing drums, the baritone sax, and guitar by the time he was a teenager. The pair would play in a number of high school bands in their hometown with Stevens telling louder sound. When Brad and I were doing high school bands, it wasn't so much that we were outcasts, people were completely baffled by what we were doing. And it wasn't that it got a bad response, it got no response. They would end up reading Hit Parader magazine and Metal Hammer and Rolling Stone and Cream, and they soon realized that Mississippi wouldn't offer an opportunity for them to pursue their musical dreams. The pair would soon pack up and move to LA in 1989, but the vision that the media portrayed of Los Angeles was drastically different than what they discovered upon moving to the West Coast. Stevens would recall to Louder Sound how they witnessed the last remnants of the glam metal era, which they dubbed as ultra sad, and they weren't really fans of that type of music. The pair soon met another transplant rhythm guitarist Christopher Thorne through an ad in the paper Music Connection. Thorne had already been in LA since 87 or 88, he had played in a folksy rock band at the time, and Thorne had actually went to college in York, Pennsylvania, majoring in communications, but he dropped out in his third or fourth year. Thorne at the time had the option of joining what would later become Blind Melon, or another band called Daisy Chamber, which was an LA act that featured future Foo Fighters and Wallflowers keyboardist Rami Jaffe, he would end up choosing Blind Melon. Smith and Stevens would meet Shannon Hoon through a mutual friend at a party. Stevens and Smith were auditioning vocalists and invited Hoon to their makeshift studio with Stevens recalling to spin. The guy before Shannon, we kind of worked with him for a few days to see if he could write lyrics to the stuff that we were doing, and he was like a male model, just a really good looking guy who could kind of sing like he was on Broadway or something. We didn't realize you could find hundreds of people like that in LA. Hoon would end up walking into the rehearsal space with a friend, with Stevens telling the LA Times he was basically just off the bus from Indiana, but I'd already heard about him. He was that kind of guy, he just filled a room. Hoon at the time was actually living with Guns N' Roses frontman Axl Rose. Rose went to high school with Hoon's sister back in Lafayette, and she asked the frontman to look out for her brother when he arrived in LA. Now keep in mind Guns N' Roses were one of the biggest bands in the world at the time. We'll talk a bit more about their influence and how they impacted Blind Mel's career in a bit. Hoon's father, who used to be an athlete, lived vicariously through his son, forcing him into sports back in Indiana. But Hoon soon realized that he wasn't living the life that he wanted to, and he despised some of the conservative values in his hometown, and he had no identity of his own. By his teenage years, he soon found solace in music and singing, and his early influences would include the likes of Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, Kiss, and Elton John. Hoon even fronted a heavy metal outfit back home called Stiff Kitten, 
but he started hanging out with a rougher crowd who partook in drugs and he soon became familiar to the police. His mother Nell Hoon would split from her husband and would tell Rolling Stone that Hoon's teenage years were a nightmare as he dived deeper into drugs and alcohol telling Rolling Stone that at one point she had four bail bonds for her son revealing, I'd hear an ambulance and if Shannon wasn't home, I'd get sick to my stomach. I always expected the worst. And there were times I didn't think he'd live that long. Hoon was soon finished with Lafayette telling the Albuquerque Journal, I think I was raised in a community where there were a good group of people and the so-called bad group of people. Where I'm from, Purdue University is in our city. If you didn't graduate from high school and go to Purdue, you were pretty much an outcast. Hoon would leave for Los Angeles in the spring of 1990, and he left town narrowly avoiding a drug raid in the house slipping out the back. Within a month of being in LA, Hoon walked into that rehearsal space and picked up an acoustic guitar and played the song he had written called Change, and he floored his future bandmates. With the frontman's talent also came extreme unpredictability, an addictive personality, and volatile behavior. Stevens would recall to spin, he turned into Mr. Hyde. The first night we met, we went out drinking and ended up back at Brad's place. And I remember Shannon said something really stupid, which he did all the time, and I started laughing at him. Before I knew it, he was in my face with veins bulging out of his head. That's about the only time I didn't see him hit somebody in that sort of situation. Despite having assembled four-fifths of the band, they really didn't have a lot of luck finding a drummer in LA. But it would be an old friend of Stevens and Smith back in Mississippi, Glenn Graham. Graham's band conveniently had just imploded, so he set out to California. Graham had grown up playing in jam bands, covering groups like the Allman Brothers and Grateful Dead. With the lineup now complete, they came up with the name Blind Melon, a name that's attributed to Smith's father, who used to describe his friends, which were a bunch of stoner kids. Another story that's frequently reported was that the name came from Smith's father, who used Blind Melon to describe his deadbeat neighbors. Maybe those stoner kids were his neighbors. Blind Melon's musical influences would be an amalgamation of each of its members. Smith would identify with James Brown and Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, while Thorne and Graham like Led Zeppelin. Stevens, for his part, would latch onto music after hearing Band on the Run by Paul McCartney and Wings. Blind Melon's sound frequently drew comparisons to the 60s and 70s, something we'll talk a bit more later in this video about. During their early days, the band members took whatever day jobs they could get. Hoon would end up working for MTV as Headbangers Ball host Ricky Rackman's receptionist. Thorne, meanwhile, worked at a used clothing store, while Smith worked in construction. Stevens, for his part, would work at a stationery store. Within one to two weeks, the band put together a four to five song demo that fell in the hands of a hotshot attorney in Los Angeles, who actually approached the group and wanted to represent them. Within a week, they were being courted by the major record labels. Stevens would tell Rolling Stone, we only had four or five songs. Next thing we know, we're having dinners with 10 different record companies and we're lying to all of them. We're like, yeah, we got 20 songs, we've been together for a year. Blind Melon, for their part, were pretty street smart. They held out for quite a long time before signing with any label, ensuring that they got full creative control. The band were so evergreen at this point, they didn't even have a manager to guide them, and they hadn't really played any gigs around Los Angeles. Instead, they focused on writing, recording, and demoing songs. They would, of course, also consult that lawyer who first approached them, and then they would go to other lawyers to get second and third opinions on what the labels were offering and whether they were good deals or not. Within eight months of forming, Blind Melon would sign a seven album deal with Capitol Records in March of 1991. Work on their debut album was quite slow. They would spend several months in Los Angeles without much to show for their efforts as the city proved to be too distracting. Then fast forward to September of 1991. Guns N' Roses come out with two albums, Use Your Illusion 1 and 2, and drop the single Don't Cry, as well as a video for the song which featured Shannon Hoon. Hoon's connection to one of the biggest rock stars on the planet, Axl Rose, and his band GNR, generated an enormous amount of hype for Blind Melon. Rose and Hoon both hailed from Lafayette, Indiana, and Rose would in fact go to high school with Hoon's sister. Hoon would sing backup vocals on several of Guns N' Roses' songs on the Use Your Illusion records, including Live and Let Die, November Rain, The Garden, and of course Don't Cry. Without even an album to their name, Blind Melon were quickly being branded in the press, as the junior Guns N' Roses. But the band members would push back against these characterizations, telling the Durham News and Observer that they were nothing like GNR, as their influences were widely different. Smith would tell an interviewer about the GNR connection and the hype, saying, it was such a joke, it didn't have anything to do with us, and it was blown way out of proportion. Unhappy with the progress the band had made by the end of 1991, they would soon hit the road as part of MTV's 120 Minutes Tour, playing alongside Public Image Limited, Live, and Big Audio Dynamite, in addition to touring with Soundgarden. 
Soon enough, people start asking, who is this band Blind Melon and how do they get on all these major tours without even a record to their name? Some would point to their connection with GNR and riding the band's coattails. Hoon, meanwhile, would tell the LA Times, there definitely was pressure. I got tired of people wanting to talk to the band because they wanted to know about Guns N' Roses. It was following those tours, the band wanted to go somewhere quieter to record their debut record, somewhere that resembled their small town roots, but also had a thriving music scene. Drummer Glenn Graham had briefly lived in North Carolina and guided the band's attention to Chapel Hill, which had a thriving music scene, but they couldn't find a five bedroom apartment, so they rented a place in nearby Durham, close to Duke University's West Campus, to write songs for their first record. They would spend four months in a house that was dubbed the Sleepy House and it would be forever immortalized on their debut record. They would put tinfoil on the windows, they rarely left the home except to do gigs in nearby Raleigh and Chapel Hill while also doing loose rehearsals that began somewhere around 3 to 4 in the morning. Blind Melon would eventually retreat to Seattle, hooking up with Pearl Jam and Temple of the Dog producer Rick Parishar to record their first album. Hoon's lyrics would take aim at some of those small town traits he grew up around, with songs like Holy Man taking aim at the narrow-mindedness of religious conservatives, while Dear Old Dad is a tale of an old girlfriend who dumped him for religion, while the track Change chastises those same people and perhaps himself for not making necessary adjustments in one's life to make them stronger and better. The album also contained the happy sounding tune No Rain, whose lyrics were anything but. The group's debut album, which was self-titled, would be released in September of 1992. Gracing the album cover would be a mysterious B-girl. The B-girl was a photo of drummer Glenn Graham's sister from a school play when she was 4 or 5 before a tap dance class. The band were in Columbus, Mississippi one day having dinner at Graham's family home with whom we're calling to Rolling Stone. We were all sitting around in the living room and that picture just jumped out at us. Someone jokingly said that would make a great album cover. Graham's sister, for her part, didn't really mind the picture being used because she thought her brother's band would flop. The album, within its first few weeks of release, was only selling a few thousand copies a week. The momentum surrounding Blind Melon by the time they got signed had flatlined. A year had gone by from the time Hoon actually appeared in the Don't Cry video to the time the band's first album came out. The record was teetering for the most part on the edges of the Heat Seekers Billboard album charts. But that all changed in June of 1993. MTV would add the video for the single No Rain, and the rest was history. The video would become one of the most iconic that MTV ran during the 90s. The video had a feel-good message, which stood in stark contrast to what other alternative rock acts were doing at the time. The song's origins dated back to when bassist Brad Smith moved to LA. And while working a construction job, he was also busking for money on Venice Beach, and he was barely making enough to pay for parking and, as he put it, chicken teriyaki according to song facts but he was also dating a girl who was suffering from depression at the time. He would tell Song Facts that the tune was originally written from his girlfriend's perspective, but he soon noticed that it was actually written about himself. He would remark how his girlfriend would sleep through sunny days and complain when there was no rain. Once no rain picked up steam on MTV, the album quickly shot into the Billboard 200 charts, landing in number 156 before moving all the way up to number three within seven weeks. No Rain, meanwhile, topped the Modern Rock Tracks chart and also appeared on the Hot 100 charts, peaking at number 20. Soon afterwards, the album was selling more than 100,000 copies per week. The LA Times would pen an article in 1993 asking who was responsible for Blind Melon's success. The credit largely went to two people at Capitol Records. It was the head of Capitol Records who signed the band, a guy named Hale Milgram, and despite slow initial sales that saw the album hover on the Billboard Heat Seekers chart, Milgram claimed that Blind Melon would hit it big and the band just needed time on their side. Milgram would end up resigning in June of 1993, nearly a year after the group's debut album came out. He would be replaced by a guy named Gary Gersh. Gersh was instrumental in the band's success. He would end up cutting Capitol Records' roster and focus more attention on Blind Melon, and a video for No Rain was made and sent to MTV, and that changed the band's fortunes. The ninth inning success of Blind Melon's debut record meant that initial plans to go back to the studio and write their follow-up had to be postponed, as Capitol Records wanted the band to keep touring to capitalize on the success of No Rain. Blind Melon's success gave its members some stark realizations of the music industry, with bassist Brad Smith telling Rolling Stone, it's really weird how the momentum picked up because of one video. The music hasn't changed. It's been on the CD forever. What we do has not changed. The video and the politics behind everything are what changed. Success has a lot less to do with music than I thought it did. 
In reality, without the Bee Girl and No Rain, Blind Melon may have faded into obscurity, but it made the band grateful. But at the same time, it represented everything they hated about the music industry. Blind Melon's sound would frequently draw comparisons to folksy and bluesy rock groups of the 60s and 70s, with a lot of people claiming the band made hippie music, and they were frequently compared to jam bands like The Grateful Dead. One article called them whole wheat granola kits. What's funny is that a lot of the media comparisons also claim Blind Melon didn't sound like any other band, but that they also didn't sound like their influences. Blind Melon didn't take too kindly to the hippie comparison, with Shannon Hoon telling the record newspaper, I'm not a hippie by any sense of the word. I don't know what a hippie really is. The band chalked up the comparisons to hippies because of the No Rain video, the flowers in the video, the 60s looking necklace, and the long hair. The band with their newfound success appeared on the front cover of Rolling Stone in 1993 and they shot several covers. One showed them dismembering the body of the Bee girl but instead the magazine went with the nude shot of the group. The band wasn't happy with that cover. The photo even caused a stir back home for three of the members from Mississippi. With the success of No Rain, the band soon also caught criticism from fellow alternative rockers over how visual imagery overshadowed the band's music. The Seattle band The Posies, who Blind Melon previously played with, blasted the group in the press, claiming that Hoon's outfit was nothing more than a one-hit wonder. Stevens would tell the Indianapolis News, Some people are trying to punish us for making a great video, which is absurd. It's like saying we were cool until they had a big video. Just because it got shoved down people's throats, it's not our fault. Blind Melon would sometimes be referred to as the B-Girl band, and No Rain was sometimes dubbed the B-Girl song. But Hoon started to detest the success of No Rain, specifically the video, telling the interviewer, I don't like the fact that some people like No Rain only because of the video. It has to be the other way around. If it's not, don't buy our record. Blind Melon would hit the road in 1993 with Guns N' Roses in the spring and summer, and followed it up by opening for Neil Young and later on Lenny Kravitz. It was in October of 1993, Hoon faced nudity and indecent exposure charges after he stripped and urinated on stage during a concert in Vancouver. He was later charged for attacking a security guard during the taping of the American Music Awards in February of 1994. It was during this period Hoon was also struggling with substance abuse issues, specifically cocaine. Then on April 8, 1994, Blind Melon would appear on David Letterman's Late Night Show. It was the same day that Kurt Cobain's body was found in his Seattle home. The band would perform the song Change with Hoon having a question mark on his forehead, dedicating the tune to Cobain. It was an eerie foreshadowing for the band's future, but Cobain's death scared Hoon into at least temporary sobriety for the time being, and he would attend a 30-day program. Blind Melon would play the biggest show of their career a few months later at the 25th anniversary of Woodstock, but Hoon would later admit to his bandmates and the band's manager that he wasn't sober during that performance as he was tripping on acid. His bandmates at one point tried to stage an intervention for the frontman, but Hoon didn't show up. The singer's volatile behavior coupled with disputes over songwriting royalties only caused more friction within the band. While the plan was to split songwriting credits evenly, Hoon wanted a bigger portion of the band's publishing. But despite the turmoil, Hoon thought that the band would have some longevity telling the Orlando Sentinel, one thing people fail to realize is that we only have one record out. We're pups at this, and we've been forced to mature under the microscopic eye of everybody. We've learned a lot of things that will help us keep doing this for a long time. The band would relocate to New Orleans to record their second studio album, but it was perhaps one of the worst decisions the band made in their history, given the city's temptations. Smith would tell Ladder Sound, We didn't go into the studio until 2 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and nobody left until the sun was coming up. It was a total vampire existence laced with drugs, alcohol, and f craziness. Fast forward a year later to July of 1995, and Hoon becomes a father when his longtime girlfriend gives birth to their daughter Nico Blue. A month later, their sophomore effort titled Soup would be released, where it would peak at number 28 on the Billboard album charts. The album's sales were a commercial disappointment, but by their label's own admission, due to the success of No Rain, they thought it bordered on overexposure, and reps for the label would tell Billboard that they didn't see Blind Melon as being a singles band. Instead, they thought that Blind Melon would develop a fan base more similar to, well, you guessed it, The Grateful Dead. Being a father who wanted to get sober, hitting rehab, and ahead of a planned tour to support the album, the band employed a drug counselor. The early part of the tour saw Hoon, as well as his girlfriend and their baby, join them on the bus, and it felt more like a positive environment. According to Hoon's bandmates, they thought that Shannon was doing better. That sobriety coach, however, that the band employed would be let go, 
when they were found not to be doing their job, as during a stopover in LA, Hoon would relapse. Hoon's daughter and wife by this point in the tour had left, and the band was now headed to Texas to play a show in Houston. That show would take place on October 20th, 1995, and the set by the band's own admission was pretty sloppy. The band soon boarded their bus and headed for their next show in New Orleans, and while the bandmates got some rest, Shannon stayed up the whole night on a drug binge. It was upon pulling into New Orleans that Hoon wandered around the city for a little while while his bandmates retreated to their hotel. Hoon would return to their bus and fall asleep in his bunk where he'd be found unresponsive by one of the band's roadies. His death would be ruled a drug overdose and he would be just 28 years old. Drummer Glenn Graham would remark in the book Devil on One Shoulder and Angel on the Other, it's surreal. We're at the funeral for a friend and everything is over. Your life as you know it is over. Some would criticize the band for hitting the road so soon after Hoon just left rehab. But Steven shot back at critics telling Louder Sound, We caught a lot of flack later on, but I always told people, look, this guy's showing up to rehearsal 20 pounds underweight, and we hadn't been around him. Then we got on tour. He was clean for a while in the beginning. This was one of those instances where it was a two-day situation that got him where he was today. In the weeks after Hoon's death, Stevens would tell the LA Times, I moved to New York City like five days after Shannon's funeral. It was psychologically damaging. I didn't have the skills to know what to do with myself after something like that. I had to put all my chips on the table and lost them all. I felt lost for years. Blind Melon would release their 1996 compilation record, Nico, as a tribute to Hoon, with proceeds from album sales going to Hoon's daughter and funded programs to help musicians who were dealing with addiction. The surviving members of Blind Melon tried to replace Hoon and hold auditions, but they would scrap the idea of breaking up in 1999. As for the surviving members, Thorne opened up a recording studio in LA alongside bassist Brad Smith, while Stevens played in a few other bands and got into painting and even became a lawyer, while Glenn Graham would live a quiet life in North Carolina. It would be an Atlantic Records representative who hooked up Travis Warren with Smith and Thorne with the idea of doing some recordings. The former Blind Melon members noticed that the frontman shared a lot of similarities with Shannon Hoon and was influenced by him. In fact, he even had a huge tattoo of the frontman on his back. Warren, for his part, had suffered through his own substance abuse issues like Hoon, but he managed to clean up his act. The band would reform in 2006 and release their most recent record in 2008, titled For My Friends. The band's most recent tour would happen in 2019, and they are set to be working on their long-awaited follow-up record. In 2019, the documentary All I Can Say about the band's early career would be released, and it largely consisted of the period from 1990 to 1995, and it consists of footage shot by Hoon on his camcorder. As for the B-Girl, she would show up at the 1993 MTV Video Music Awards, reprising her role as the B-Girl to close out the show. She would speak to Entertainment Weekly in 1995, admitting that she was not a big alternative rock fan. Instead, she was a fan of groups like TLC and salt and Peppa. Following the shoot for the video for No Rain, she would never hear again from the members of Blind Melon, and she'd appear in films like I'll Do Anything and Camp Nowhere, as well as Beautician and the Beast, among many other credits. Her initial plans were to go into acting, but in 2017, People Magazine caught up with her. She was now 38, a Cal State graduate in communications, and was married to a financial advisor and had at least one child. She was now working as a spokesperson for a cosmetic surgeon. But in 2020, she did reprise her role as a B-girl on the Fox TV show, I Could See Her Voice. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again in Rock and Ultra Stories.